Well, here we are, folks, right here back with a guest of the show who has been a guest before. And so good to see you again. Hello and welcome back, Robert. Hi, Beth. Uh, how are you? I hope you're doing well. I think you're in Chicago right now. So uh, uh, you must be enjoying the beautiful summer weather out there. Yes, it's perfect. I was just saying uh, to someone how these nights are so perfect for looking up and stargazing because you don't need a jacket, you're not freezing, it's comfortable, but it's cool. And that that's something we're really enjoying here. How about by you? Well, if you stay up a little bit late enough, uh, past 1130 right now, you can see Saturn, Uranus, yeah. uh, and Jupiter all in the same area, just up the horizon. So it's beautiful. I have a nice what? telescope, so I like to take it out. From oh, that's nice. That's really nice. Um, yeah. Yeah, it is gorgeous time to do that. We were just walking the dog the other day and we saw three satellites go overhead in less than like 20 minutes. Like yeah. just there they go. And then we looked up five minutes later and then there goes another one. And we looked on our phone, two of them we could find. And then the other one was not classified or not, um, it didn't have any information on it. So. Oh, I see. So you have one of those uh, satellite finder apps, right? To yeah. tell you what it is yeah Good. yeah pretty cool and um, yeah. it's those are always fun and i'm always i can spot them pretty well i mean chicago has we're outside of chicago but not as much light pollution as most and they're pretty easy to find because they move so slowly um but quickly like not as slow as the international space station which i feel right. it moves slow you can see it really slowly progressing but these satellites are zooming by yeah, there and there are lots of those little puppies up there right now. Lots and lots of them. We'll talk a little bit about that because it's a, it's just a, it's wonderful how much how much is happening right now in the space industry. You know, it's just it's it's a great time to be alive in the space industry. Beth. It is. I know. I cannot wait to talk to you because you've been busy. <laughs> you've been on the show before, and you were just getting some things started. And since then, things have progressed. So which of the 27 endeavors would you like to jump into first? You've got, <laughs> <laughs> you've got your launch location services and companies on each end of Canada. And then you've got yep. some planes that are delivering all kinds of experiences and potential satellites. You've got all kinds of things. So which, where should we start? Well, let's start with the first one. Let's start with Canada first. Okay. Um, you know, Great stuff happening there. I, I've been working with uh, the CEO of uh, Maritime Launch Services in Canada and Nova Scotia. And he's been working on with the Canadian government regulators to try to get a license to establish a spaceport, right? For about, I would say, four and a half to, to five years now, more or less. He moved, he actually moved his whole family from uh, um, uh, New Mexico okay. uh, to Canada. Uh, with the hopes of getting a license to to be able to build that, because he participated in getting Spaceport America going, Midland Spaceport going, and a few others. So uh, obviously a Spaceport type of person. And he thought, you know, that little tiny eastern tip of Nova Scotia, that little finger that sticks out is almost the easternmost point in all of North America. Mm -hmm. That would be a great place to launch rockets from, right? Sure. If I could get a license. Same. So he's been working on that. And so now... Finally, the approvals and the environmental assessments and so forth have been pretty much uh, completed so that he can start building. And, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about, you know, what, what has been done with the company. But essentially, you have now access to the easternmost little tip of North America to launch rockets from, and they're all launching over the ocean. They don't so have any cool. cities or any population. Yeah. Like them. So it's a wonderful place to, to build a spaceport from. And what do the people of Nova Scotia think? Are they embracing it with open arms and being like, yes? Or are they kind of like, this is different and new, and this is going to be something we're going to learn to embrace? I, I think you're 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 tuning into some, to a very, a very uh, an important sensitivity out there. Yeah, yeah. Because as you might imagine, uh, Nova Scotia is obviously uh, uh, a fishing area, right? Uh, and um you know lobster is is the industry out there yeah. right in fact a lot of the fishermen out there in in, in the eastern corner of, of nova scotia say that you can almost see the end of the world from Ooh. there the tip of nova scotia because all you see is ocean there so it was not an easy process whatsoever mm. to get them to to get used to an idea of launching you know rockets right from yeah. from an area that is actually very pristine and very beautiful and very natural looking but 
again, the, uh, in, I've been working with and assisting Steve Mateer, the CEO there, for several years now as a consultant uh, on several aspects that he wanted to investigate further uh, in this. And so he's really, really um, gotten very close to the local populations to explain what he's trying to do there, to explain that the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, you know, sensitivity that he has himself yeah. to keeping the environment pristine and good and so forth yeah. and not to make it converted into one of these spaceport launches one satellite or one rocket a day and nothing like that but explaining them of the benefits and the jobs and all the rest of the things along with the fact that he's pledged personally and with the company to really respect you know the really. the, the the needs and the wants and sensitivity sensitivities of the local population That's there so, so cool. they're embracing him now he has really strong support from the province, Good. and he also has strong support from the government, even though the government is not putting money in the company. This is a private yeah. venture, right? Um, the company did go private in April. Uh, I'm sorry, it could go public in April in the uh, NEO stock market in uh, Canada. So that was another big milestone we achieved, uh, you know, going public with a $100 million valuation uh, at launch on the April 22nd. So the company is well on its way to get something done there. And it's a really wonderful thing for Canada, Beth, because it's the very first commercial spaceport in Canada. And as a matter of fact, it'll be the first commercial spaceport in North America because all the other spaceports are basically partially government uh, financed, right? Ah, yes. Uh, so, and, and it'll give you the largest range of orbital inclinations available from a single site in all of North America. That's really cool. Over the ocean. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Did I see you? Did you participate in the Stardust Festival that was in Canada recently, remotely? No, or, no. Well, it was so great because it was an inaugural event where they really are looking to showcase the connections that the people of Canada and especially the Indigenous people who might not otherwise have opportunities for STEM based fields to be mm -hmm. investing and spending time in the space community. So it was just a start and we got it started. And I can't help but think about how exciting and how wonderful it is for your friend and your colleague to honor the people of Canada and their wishes and the indigenous people who so strongly value the land and the pristine, you know, beautiful country that they have, but also recognize, and I'll say like the modern technologies that Canada brings to the world where you can have these spaceports and other things where they really can lead the way. It's been a really neat mirror and marriage to, to watch. And we're going to be watching that here very very soon so commercial flights and commercial payloads will be able to launch from nova scotia what about the other side of canada is there plans for that in the future or is that on the map not, not really um again because this particular spaceport sticks out so much into the ocean i see uh you can actually launch uh, missions going westward a little bit, uh, what we call sun synchronous missions. Okay. And sun synchronous missions are the ones that typically fly out of Vandenberg Air Force Base, right, in in the United States, because you can go westward from there. You don't you don't fly over land, and by doing that, you can kind of follow the sun as the Earth turns, so that you can have imagery and a lot of the Earth observation satellites. They love to go to what we call SSO, right, sun synchronous orbits. Uh, you can do that from Can from Canada, from that uh, spaceport as well, as well as going 45 degrees east uh, towards towards uh, with the rotation of the Earth. So it's really a, a, a very amazing range of inclinations, like I told you before, that they would be kind of uniquely positioned to offer from there, right, for That's multiple cool. launch vehicles. So yes. very, very fun, fun stuff. And like you said, bringing in uh, a whole a host of, of new jobs to the area with the sensitivity of the local population to preserving the environment, but also, you know, for example, establishing a fire station that will be dedicated to the spaceport, but that fire station will also be a backup yeah. to the town of Canso that okay. needs that, you know, yeah. those kind of partnerships have been, have been uh, promised and established to do that will actually help the local community in many ways. Right. So yeah. it's a nice, nice, uh, 
it's it's a very nice partnership. It's a great, wonderful project to be involved. With. You know, I can't help but think about uh, Robert. Have you ever been down to Stennis or the Michoud yeah. facility? Okay, so the rocket uh, testing facilities yes, right. at NASA's Stennis Center, and so it's beautiful. And let's be honest, most of the NASA centers are on properties that are protected and that are not necessarily launch facilities, but they're space based, and so they're usually in land that was either inexpensive, right? Government entity mm -hmm. properties, but they also continue to protect it. So I remember going to the main gate. Of course, I was running late because anyone who knows me knows. I, <laughs> to me, I, on time is on time. I'm not one of those, I'm 15 minutes early all the time, although I'm becoming <laughs> now. So I get to the main gate or what I thought was the main gate. And they were like, no, no, you have to go to this facility to go to the testing facility. And it has to, you have to go all the way around. And I thought, no problem. Well, all the way around was actually cutting through two states, like actually crossing borders <laughs> around the whole entire fenced facility. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, if you could just honor the badge and let me cut through, I'll be there in like two minutes. They're like, nope, you go all the way around. And being <laughs> and having forcing me to do that, I got to see the fenced in area, the natural land, the protection, the way they honor the coastline and the way they honor the, um, the wetlands that was surrounding the facility. And I'm like, okay, all right, this is no no um, cutting corners here. When they really say that they honor and protect, they do, even from yeah. late ladies who are coming to cross, to cut corners and go through. <laughs> They're like, nope, everyone no, goes no, no. around. <laughs> not today, lady. Right, no, not no. today. <laughs> Listen, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is exciting. That sounds like that is underway. So operational soon, next couple years, next next year. What are we thinking? Yeah, there it's a phased approach. So, so the spaceport, uh, you know, the cement work and the civil works uh, start uh, basically now. Uh, mm -hmm. The and and the sim facility would be very very simple to begin with in 2023, because there's a first launch that has been announced with a local, I say local, a Canadian rocket launch manufacturer called Reaction Dynamics based oh, in Montreal. Cool, and it's a small uh you know uh, a canadian rocket manufacturer that will do a sounding rocket launch so just straight up and straight down okay. not orbital okay. uh, and we will also carry a small canadian payload so it'll be canadian launcher canadian payload with a canadian spaceport right so that's nice. sort of the first step in getting the regulators happy with the process a simple launch pad mobile facilities for tanking and the rest of the stuff and nav canada and transport canada the regulators um, we'll get a taste of what it's like to, you know, work together to do a first launch, right, out of the East Coast there. Next so, year, that's fast. Yeah, that's coming up. And, you know, you don't need a big, uh, huge infrastructure to do it. So that's a very, very feasible first phase uh, step to take, which also makes, um, you know, the investors happy of the company that, okay, oh, this sure. is the first thing happening, you know. Um, what is planned then for the second uh, step of this first phase is to do an orbital launch with a uh, small rocket operator, uh, the the likes of the 300 to 500 kilogram category for payloads. Okay. okay. Uh, we haven't announced who that is, but it will be announced at some point soon. Mm -hmm. uh, but that'll be an orbital launch with an actual payload to go to orbit, right? Do you and already so, have a list? You already have a yes. customer? Of course. Yes. Because yes. everyone's backlogged, Robert. Everyone is right. waiting for, there's cargo sitting and payloads just waiting to go, right? Absolutely. It's incredible. It fast right enough. Now. It's incredible, <laughs> you know? So phase two of the, of the maritime launch spa spaceport then will be in 2024, okay. where we would be launching the, the uh, Cyclone 4M vehicle, which is basically, if you look at the Antares vehicle right now, okay. uh, the main stage, the first stage is built by, by Yuzhnoya from uh, Ukraine. Uh, and that's the first stage of the rocket. The second stage of the rocket, for example, is used with a Vega launcher in Europe. And these guys supply it to a big part of the industry, you know, different stages of rockets and engines and so forth. Unfortunately, of course, the situation is not easy in the Ukraine. Yeah. And yeah. we just had a, a long four hour PDR this morning with them. Uh, and, uh, you know, they've been living without their wives and their children for six months now. Oh, right? gosh. Yeah. Uh, but they're still working, they're still operating, and they're luckily so somewhat in the middle of the country. 
So it's business as usual, except they're without families, right? So oh, it's a very sad situation oh. for, our, for our very, very smart and very, very capable colleagues there, yeah. but they're continuing to work as they've always have. So we just cross fingers and we hope that's going to be all fine. And that's a five ton payload category vehicle. So it's called a, it's a, so what we call a medium launch class vehicle. Really? So obviously that's something that we, that th this is our, our strong partner for the sort of constellation, satellite constellation launches, because they need a bigger payload capacity to be able to launch several of them or a few dozens of them at the same time. And it's called um, the Cyclone. The Cyclone 4M, yeah. 4M, okay, cool. Yeah. So, uh, and so that'll be 2024, late 24, probably. Uh, and and then after that, of course, we get into a tempo of uh, various different types of launch uh, vehicles from that spaceport. And that's obviously with a full facility, full launch control centers and everything else, right? That's really great. When you build a facility like this, do you build up and scale or do you build big so that any payload, any launch vehicle can can launch from the facility? Well, the first the first two phase one vehicles that I mentioned, the the, the sounding rocket launch and the uh, the orbital small rocket launch system will be all supported by mobile uh, facility mobile vehicles. So okay. you know you'll have tanking and, and power and all the rest of the stuff. Even communications will be uh, mobile units. So these can be deployed anywhere very easily. Okay. Uh, for that, you don't need really the, the complete facilities. But uh, our plan is to build the complete facility in 2024. And that one will be able to, to house two full Cyclone 4 m rockets uh, at the same time uh, within the facility. And that obviously is going to be a complete uh, spaceport with all everything that it needs to have to be able to process the payloads, uh, integrate the uh, the sensitive equipment into the uh, uh, satellite systems before they're put into the payloads and and the, and the launch vehicle, and then of course all the, all the associated services with tanking and and erecting the rocket and then launching it of course as well sure. for the operations. So a full wow. team of people and complete facilities, right? Okay, so. As if that wasn't enough to do, you're also doing other projects, including being um, a major player in this new adventure where you're going to carry not just people above, um, but cargo below a certain kind of plane. Walk us through that new project. Yeah, this is uh, this is my company, uh, Beth. I, I founded this uh, company about a year and a half to two years ago. Uh, zero G launch and zero G launch is a company that uh, that intends to modify several. It's it's a small fleet of uh, uh, Boeing seven five seven aircraft. Okay. Get the interior of the aircraft, uh, leave seats on the front and the back, and then in the middle section of the vehicle, provide parabolic flights. Yes. So, so you can do zero gravity flights uh, for Ooh. consumers in different parts of the world. So we have. Uh, about 170 million dollars worth of commitments now for flights around yeah. the world, wow. uh, which is just fantastic to see the demand there that the public has to want to experience these kind of flights, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we'll do uh, consumer flights with these aircraft. Uh, why not? That's a, a quick revenue producer for the company, so it's a great way to to sort of monetize uh, all the capital investments for with these aircraft. Um, but we'll also be providing um, a very high performance. Uh, R&D flights for people that are, need to test equipment before they launch to, to space. And that's a big part of the market today that is just doesn't have enough facilities, nor are they uh, precise enough, nor are they plentiful enough. And so we, we intend to fill the gap there that, that is very, very badly needed today, in the, in the especially in the small satellite industry, sure. to be able to do that. So Astronaut training is another one of the, of the services for the interior of the aircraft. So that's a bit of a simpler procedure with the aircraft by modifying the interior only. And we'll be flying that under a, an FAA regime that allows us to fly these within the envelopes of what we call Part 121, which means that we don't have to have any really fancy, fancy licenses to perform those flights, right? Wow. Now, under your underbelly of the aircraft, that's a phase two. I like phases, as you, if you can tell that's here. That's okay. Uh, the phase one too. was that. Yeah, I like phase it. Phase two <laughs> is modifying the underbelly of the aircraft with a um, an interface uh, that goes clicks under the aircraft, and that will be uh, licensed or STC'd with the aircraft, such that it can carry different types, different shapes of rocket power vehicles, including hypersonic vehicles. 
And today in the United States, we are uh, in dire need of more commercial support infrastructure to accelerate hypersonic uh, vehicle development uh, right now. We've fallen a little bit behind in, in the world scene on hypersonics. And this is something that, especially in the DOD markets, they're very anxious to accelerate now. And they've uh, we have a couple of LOIs with customers who are integrators of hypersonic vehicles that will be our clients to be able to do captive carry flights, do drop test flights, do aerodynamic testing flights of these vehicles, and even launch of these vehicles from under the underbelly. So that's a great, great uh, other area that will be a phase two modification to uh, to the fleet of six aircraft. That so we plan for to all the students listening, does that mean that there will be people and a launch vehicle in the same plane and could happen at the same time? Or would they be separate? Uh, no, they would not happen at the same, it would be the same aircraft, but, this, oh, but the see. aircraft will only be, will fly under a different regime, a launch okay. regime. Uh, when it is uh, to launch any kind of uh, rocket power vehicle. Okay. Uh, we we then take that interface off the, the aircraft and it flies under the regular 121 regime cool. for parabolic flights. Okay. Yeah. okay. So we can dual purpose these vehicles. And that and one of the reasons why we do that, Beth, is because you know when you have a, a capital investment in something ex as expensive as an aircraft, then you want to have it flying as much as possible, right? Yeah. And so by doing this, we're multi-purposing the vehicle so it's not just a one trick pony mm -hmm. it actually has variable mar different markets that it can respond to and uh, and therefore uh, a much much better business plan in terms of revenues and profits as well so this company you've had it in the works for a while have you been working on soliciting the actual planes the 757s the staff that's going to help maintenance and fly them as well and where are they going to be based out of or will they fly to the location they need to go to um, both, actually. We, we will base the aircraft uh, in the United States because that's where we would be licensing the aircraft and they belong okay. to the, they would belong to the company. So they would be flying under an FAA uh, license. Uh, it, it so happens that many countries around the world recognize the FAA uh, licensing regime. So we would have reciprocal agreements that would be okay. recognized. Not all countries, but many do. So we would be able to fly around the world and uh, big, you know, uh, big metropolises around the world uh, and we're working on an agreement also in Asia right now to do so. So it's exciting because it brings, you know, a space related activity to, to a much, much larger uh, uh, base of people. Yeah. And space is very, very cool right now. There's a lot big awareness around the world of, you know, the coolness of, be, of, of being able to one day have hundreds and hundreds of people flying to space every year. Uh, and of course it starts with the space tourism, tourism sector. Uh, sort of the high end and the more you do the more you do the more vehicles you have the, the sure. lower the price drops right yeah. and we intend to be uh, uh, very very aggressive on the pricing as well so that it's a fun activity for consumers and it's a space related activity by by virtue of the fact that these uh, vehicles will be called the space jets because they're dual purpose vehicles right and very smart because as we said there's so many in waiting they're just waiting for that ride they're waiting for that transportation and so uh they're just looking for the vehicle facilities to do that so you know that's fantastic it's interesting you're saying that because just as a data point right uh from, from what you just said right now uh in the history of humankind you know we've launched roughly eight and a half or so thousand satellites since I'm talking since uh, 57 when Sputnik was launched, right? Yes. Or maybe it was 56, I can't remember. But nevertheless, 65 years in our history of space exploration, roughly 8,500 satellites launched. Mm -hmm. Not all of them are operational, about half of them are operational today. In the next 10 years, there's a pipeline of satellites that have obtained already frequencies from the FCC to transmit and intend to launch 60,000 satellites, 10 years. So you imagine the number today is eight, eight and a half of in the history uh, uh, since we started this and we're intent to launch, if all do launch 60,000 in only 10 Ooh. years. So it is accelerated at a pace that, we, that we've never would have imagined and it's exciting, but that brings also certain issues with it, right? In terms of, you know, orbital traffic, uh, debris, and all the rest of the things that are 
big issues that we have to deal with today, right? So uh, I heard you talk about this with our friends and colleagues a little bit on um, Space in 60. And I really enjoyed this part of the conversation because you had mentioned the difference between just sending something up and then sending up a new version, like an iPhone. Will you walk us through how that would work and how help us understand how we are going to see the future of these satellites be constant and more and more um, used and, and even cheaper and accessible for all of us? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the industry for the first 20 or so years in the commercial industry anyway for, for satellites, we had been building and I did a lot of these and financed them by build these school size uh, satellites, right? School, school bus size uh, satellites. These are big, big satellites weighing five, six, even sometimes seven tons. When you do something like that, and these were, are, and still are very, very good for video services, broadcasting, uh, even broadband connections, you know, transmitting phone connections from side to side, uh, a different part of the world and so forth. But um, these satellites always took us a year or two to design and finance three or so years to build so now you're in year five yeah and then they lasted about 15 16 or 17 years so now you're talking 20 plus years from beginning to end of a particular satellite project right sure. mm -hmm. can you imagine today uh designing something that you have to look in a crystal ball 20 years forward for it's it's just not even possible with, no the, with the, speed of the internet right right so what has happened in our industry is that we've moved now to very, very light, very, very small uh, dorm refrigerator or smaller sized uh, satellites that are using the latest and greatest of technology because we don't have to um, harden the the uh, the microchips or harden the electronics to against radiation because these are deemed to be good enough if they last three years, four years, maybe max five years, right? And these are small satellites, what you do now is you don't just launch one big one, you launch several small ones in formation flight. Mm -hmm. And when you have formation flights, you can have the equivalent of some of these big satellite kind of um, uh, resolutions, sensitivities, uh, functionalities, uh, because you're now using a small quote unquote constellation of maybe 10 or even a few thousands of these satellites that together offer you some incredible services, right? So because they're not lasting that long, you can put the latest and greatest uh, that's available, iPhone type, iPhone-like uh, technology in there that you know will be consumed or perhaps you know burned by radiation to, in, in in three four years. But that's okay because guess what? You launch some more to replace those, right? And yeah. you keep launching the newer and the best and so forth. So some companies now are developing incredible services, and they're using their platforms uh, with even more integrated chips and integrated circuitry for what they originally intended and saying, hey, we have a little extra space here. We can now offer where we've, we're, we're currently flying 100 plus of our satellites for our own services. Anybody wants to put their services on, on our little satellites that we're sending out to replace the old ones now that we're sending several dozen of every year, be welcome. Come in and you can create some new services now. So you're getting these little sort of hotel rooms hotel room space or, or real estate that is available for new technology developers that want to put new sensors or new instruments in there. They want to develop their own services without having to launch their own satellites even. So the innovation right now, Beth, is just crazy and it's wonderful to see. It yeah. really is. Well, yeah. and they certainly have your guidance. You've been doing this for quite some time. You've seen yep. it. You've definitely seen it evolve through the years. I mean, talking about a bus size satellite into something so small and efficient. And then did you ever think, I mean, honestly, when you see something being built and it takes those 15 years or it functions for that long, it's sad when it's done or when it needs to come down or when it needs to re-entry or when it's just done. Now it's like, let it be done, let it re let it extinguish, and then next, because we can. It's it's really kind of become something that we we held so much value in because we built the thing and it works and it's great, and we're getting all kinds of data back from it. And now it's almost like the days when we all first got the iPhones. And we were mm -hmm. like, wait a minute, you've just changed the game. It's smaller, it contains more, it can do more. Um, 
And now it's so commonplace that the next generations, they're like, well, of course we access space. Well, of course we have things that we can get back and forth. And soon, Robert, and I've been waiting to get to this with you, it will be us. You are so optimistic about this. And you really say like in our future, we're gonna just be jumping over to Hawaii. And I love that future. And I love that you think that, and I love that you're part of the solutions for all these things. So when these things happen, what will you think be that turning point? Will it be that the price goes down? Will it be that we all become adventurers? Will it be because we will finally be able to, and I think we already do this, you and I are in this industry, so I would think we would agree that we are already solving for earth and space. And that will be the turning point where we say, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna go to Hawaii in 30 minutes, but we're also gonna be able to bring so much material. It won't be, this island that can't receive the you know fresh and um you know latest and will be bringing and transporting more than ever before and maybe perhaps in the past that was limited that was expensive what do you think it's going to be that will make us see that future that you envision well you know um i think we spoke a little bit about this right at the beginning uh in in you know uh, when you have these uh uh, billionaire space tourist kind of uh, markets, right? For for taking a ride to space for ten minutes, or, or and and coming back and yeah. and uh, and you know paying hundreds of hundreds of thousands of dollars for that privilege, right? Um, it has to start somewhere, right? They kind of grease the wheel, so it slowly turns, and the equation is very simple: the more players you have, uh, the the more innovation goes into the product and the services that you're doing, the lower the price becomes, the more accessible it becomes for everyone, for the commonplace people, right? Uh, just like the airplanes did, right? The yeah. first flights of the airplanes were extremely expensive in today's dollars, right? For yeah. the first jet airplane flights, for example. And look, today uh, you have to you have to fight kind of like like sheep to get into the aircraft there because there's so many people and so many airplanes and so many airports now. Yes, truly. Really. You know, right? Yeah. So uh, to me. Uh, you know, knowing what I know, and I know you know it as well, Beth, in our industry, these developments are real. You know, you you, you heard the contracts that the this past these past few days uh, from American Airlines uh, ordering twenty Booms supersonic aircraft from uh, from Boom Supersonic, and a few days before that, the uh, United Airlines had also confirmed a down payment that they made for the 20 that they had ordered a few years ago from Boom Supersonic. So this is 40 supersonic aircraft that will be in the pipeline in yes. the next few years to yes. offer you flights at roughly half the speed that we, or half the, the time and double the speed that we have yeah. today in normal aircraft, right? Which the is Concord. very, very cool. Do you remember that? Do you remember the yeah. Concorde? <laughs> we were all hoping that was like tomorrow and it's been yeah. years, years. It's been so many years, retired. you know? But 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 what you said about being able to now to to envision doing that hop to Hawaii in in you know thirty minutes or to Tokyo in thirty minutes it's real because we can uh, bring rockets back we've we've seen that and and uh, and obviously Elon has done it over a hundred times bringing rockets back and some of those rockets have been used over thirteen times a few of them already so yeah. we're getting to the place where uh, these rockets are used over and over and over again we're getting to the place where we can land them in barges or land them possibly in another place uh, of earth very very quickly so you can see that multiple players will be vying to get a piece of that market because the transportation market point to point on earth is going to be enormous yes enormous and big players are starting to put the money there where the mouth is to, it's getting there, exciting so. i feel like you know everyone when i was at nasa it's, it was really cool to be at nasa when i was and and to have your career robert just the things that you've been able to see and acknowledge you were with spacex for a while and some of the major companies and some traditionals and now the startups so the things that you've been able to experience is just so incredible and you know, there was this lull that I think we all, and I don't consider it a lull because while the rest of the world may have said, well, we're not seeing shuttle after shuttle after space launch and all these things true, but 
we also, during that time, that 20 year period, we assembled the International Space Station. So I didn't think it was boring or not busy at all because I'm like, you guys, things are happening up there as we speak. And I always felt that the lull though was like, okay, 50 years ago, almost 60 plus was the Apollo and the first endeavors of leaving planet and going elsewhere. And it seems like we're right on the cusp of what's next. And I'm so grateful to be alive during this era because it's like, I'm unfortunately didn't, I didn't get to witness or be here for Apollo, but I'm here now for it all. And it yeah. seems like we're advancing really quickly and we're doing more. We're going to go past the moon and on to Mars. And I mean, just in our lifetime, we've seen Cassini and we've seen exoplanets now, and we're able to land rovers on Mars and take samples and from asteroids and whoever would have thought, I mean, the people of Nova Scotia are probably hearing this right now and saying, exactly. We never thought our backyard would be the place in which we can access the universe. And yet exactly. it's happening it's here. So I'm feeling really lucky that we're kind of on this cusp. And, and look, Beth, right now, you just mentioned the moon and Mars, even just on, on, on the moon, how many companies are involved there, right? Yeah. Uh, these are private companies, small companies, startups that have young people saying, we can, we can, we can do this. And they are now vying for a little piece of the market to establish themselves and, and put a demonstrators. There's about 14, 15 companies now that are doing things there for the moon. I mean, we we never saw this in the past, right? We saw it was the government had to do it and it was, you know, the Russians or ourselves or, yeah. or and China's doing that, of course. But, uh, you know, this is this is the era of private companies flourishing to, dev to devise solutions, finance solutions and provide some real, real products yeah. um, that, that will bring this 3D printing with local uh, local local matter, you know, and on the moon and Mars. I mean, you have to think that way, right? Because you can't bring everything with you to build things. You have to build it with local, uh, local you know, uh, availability of, yeah. of, uh, of regolith and things like that. So these are real things that are being devised and real things that are being designed to do. And it's just, it's, you know, uh, if, how, who could even imagine, right, that we, we could have th tens of thousands of companies now around the world thinking and, and innovating and saying, yeah. how can we do this different and how can we do it cheaper? And and so many of them uh, working in tandem doing these things that, I mean, you and I are going to be seeing some things that we would have never dreamt of, of seeing in the next 20 years. But. Yes. And now I know why. I usually would ask you the question, so how do you sleep and eat with all the things you're doing to get this going and up and running? And you're always in something that's new and innovative and turning that corner to be part of all this. When do you have time to sleep? But um, as a person who sees the future and sees yeah. that this is what's happening, it's engaging, it's exciting. You're like, I want to get going. I have a vision. I wanna get this into the hands of everyone to enjoy and experience and, and so I, I, I can only imagine that's what drives you. Do oh, you, absolutely. Do you have a balance though? Do you ever feel like, you know, I could have gone into like, <laughs> I could have gone into landscaping and then I would have had a seasonal job or, or a little bit of time and reprieve in between, <laughs> or you just, this is your, this has always been where you wanted to be. Well, you know, I, I, I told you in our previous conversation that, uh, you know, I didn't really choose space per se. I didn't right. say, oh, I'm going to be a space person <clears throat> when I was it a kid. You. Yeah, it found me. But, you know, um, once it bites you, it's so strong that, of course, coffee does help. Lots of coffee, especially <laughs> in the morning, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but it just bites you. And, and I'm always thinking about it. And I'm always yeah. reading about it. And everything that I do, all my books, Unfortunately, I'm, I'm a space cadet because everything I read is always has something to do with the oh, industry sure. or space or exploration or something like that. I, it's not that I don't like other things and I love music and I love, you know, arts and other things. Uh, but this thing has just grabbed me by the reins and it just doesn't let go. And it's yeah. just, it's, it's great to, to, to meet the kind of people that, uh, Jeez. that I meet. I mean, last, last week at, at, at the small side conference in Logan, Utah, uh, it was wonderful to see a whole bunch of uh, companies that I'd seen three years before. They were, well, 
planning to send something and do something with a, you know, a startup company to, to launch a CubeSat or a 3U or a 12U uh, to do something special, right? And now, two years later, they've done it. And they've yeah. done it, some of them have done it a couple of times already. And now wow. they're on the third iteration. So this kind of rapid, you know, uh, rapid design iteration improvement of, of, of the products and is, is just creating a, a, an incredible amount of, uh, of companies that are saying, yes, we can devise services that you don't know you need right now, but you that's will it. need them. That's and, it. Yes. Yeah. You know? That's finding that sweet spot where you're like, you know, this hasn't been done yet. And who can say that here on the planet Earth in, for much things? I mean, there's so much we've explored and we continue to explore and things we've invented. And yep. we're just quite, we're kind of sitting pretty, Robert. It's kind of like, look, we've solved a lot. We're very comfortable. Um, not everyone, of course, it's not equal yet in throughout the world globally, but right. we're achieving some things that are helping humanity in big ways and our planet, even though we have done damage but that's another that's another episode but here we are and we're still able to say that we haven't done this and we haven't even thought about what we need to do this in the future and that i think is what is pretty exciting at least sometimes i know i've heard you say it when you're speaking i know you've said it on other shows but it's like for students and young adults and people who are like what how do i do how do i get into this what do i do it's like whatever you think you can you can, you can, yes. even if it hasn't even been invented yet. It's something that will find a place in this industry because, I mean, who would have thought you, you had mentioned it too on another show that um, there's, there's some people who have innovated and they stayed within the niche like Elon who have said, no, we're going to keep, we're going to do it this way. It's going to reland. It's going to have the legs. It's going to go like this. And we're not going to go in any other direction. Or Richard Branson is going to say, no, we're not going to build launch facilities. We're going to take off and launch from the air. I mean, everyone's inventing as they go. And that's not something we've seen in humanity for some years. I mean, we're that's what's pretty exciting for students and young people to be like, if you don't know yet, hang in there because it will find you or you will find it or it'll be discovered. It's right there. Absolutely. And, you know, even things that you think have already been done and, and will not change anymore, uh, like GPS, right? Okay. I mean, GPS is pinging little beam, you know, little pings constantly to the earth and we drive with it and we do location tracking with your phone and right. you can you can get alerts uh, based on follow my kids. And, all your kids, <laughs> you know, yeah, all these things, right? And you can get yeah. targeted ads based on where you are and all these great things. Great, right? But that's part, all part of the, the what we've seen, the explosion of the internet uh, linked to location tracking mm -hmm. of your of where you are. But even think about just GPS as a, as a navigation tool. These companies said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a ping coming down to earth. And as I... Um, if I put in the small constellation of 50 or 40 satellites out there that are flying around the earth, now I can see the, the satellite, GPS satellite rising from the horizon or, or settling down on the horizon on the other side. Guess what? It's flying through the atmosphere. So that signal now, that little ping will bend slightly as it goes up and down in the atmosphere, as I'm seeing it rise or, or go down from, you know, from, from my point of view. So wait a minute, what can I do with that little bending of that? Guess what? I can show you some beautiful 3D graphic maps of the cloud formations and what's in them because that little GPS signal is being bent as it goes down. And with that, you have three or four or five satellites seeing that same little GPS uh, transmitter and the other ones there on the sides. And all of a sudden you have a beautiful 3D color image uh, detailing the whole composition of the clouds. So here it is, boring GPS. Yeah that we are so used to using just for navigation on earth being used for, you know, give me your wonderful, wonderful renditions of the cloud contents uh, uh, around the world. I mean, so we got a spin off from a spin off. Yeah. You think, cool. <laughs> yeah, right. And those so are the cool. kind of things that, 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 you know, a lot of people are starting to, 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 to think about, you know, it's, 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 I mean, you know, I, I go to these shows now and, and, and I, I talk to such bright, 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 minded uh, uh, people that are thinking completely differently 
And that's that's really what's so so fun about this whole thing, right? Yeah, it's different, it's innovative, and it's 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 absolutely saying, uh, you know, uh, I think I can do this. Uh, no one's told me that I can't, so I'm going to try it, and I'm going to see if I, if it works, right? That's and true. Guess what? So it's 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 a we're living a, a, in a great age. I, yeah. I know I've said this like maybe five six times already, but but we're living in a great age in the space. Right so now. true. Yes. Okay. So we talked a little bit about what inspires you. I'd really love to know some of your favorites. Like you mentioned art, you mentioned coffee, you mentioned um, the things you enjoy that are outside of the industry. What else? Have you seen anything, any good movies or any books you've read recently or anything you've kept your eye on over here on the side that you're like, that's pretty neat. Well, I, I have to admit that I'm a, a metalhead. I love heavy metal music. Okay, what's your band? Meshuga, Gojira, uh, Lamb of God, uh, all these great, great, great bands that uh, uh, that I that get together and play at big festivals. In fact, I just came back from a festival in Belgium about a month and a half ago. No way. Uh, unfortunately, I came back accompanied by a new friend and her name was COVID. Oh, I, uh, I was going to say that. But, I'm sorry. Oh, well, but that's what it is, yeah. right? I mean, with 150,000 people in a big metal festival that's uh, so over four cool. days, it, it was insanely wonderful. And it just brought me so much into my, my spirit uh, of being able to see all these great bands in one place over four days and sleeping in tents and so forth. Oh my uh, gosh. Just wonderful. I absolutely loved it. And that's another, one of the things, music that just really, really fills my soul uh, in those moments that I'm not doing space stuff. That is so <laughs> cool. Have you always been into that? Yeah, I've always liked music. I'm I'm a closet musician. I play some guitar, some piano and, and, so and, cool. and dr drums, uh, especially. And I've always been able to play a little bit of everything uh, pretty quickly because I have a pretty good ear for it, it seems. That's cool. Uh, but not recently. I haven't been playing anything because I'm just, you know, space cadet. And so, yeah, you've been but busy. it's in there. It's yeah. in the heart. Right? Have you ever heard of a Viking metal band called Tear? Yes. The Scandinavians are very, very good. <laughs> And they good. sound so good. Very, very good. You're very like, technical too. Yeah, you feel like you have been transported back in time, but also into like a futuristic genre that you haven't heard of. And yeah. it's that's cool. They yeah, are so good. Uh, uh, the Scandinavians, <laughs> uh, uh, Norwegians, and Swedes in particular are very, very good in heavy metal. They have some of the best bands around. I think. Yeah, so melodic too. It's like. Yeah. Oh, those melodies. A lot of counterpoint, a lot of complexity in the rhythms. And sometimes you have to kind of decipher as a drummer I go, wait a minute, wait a minute. What did, they, what, how did they just do this and go from counterpoints within counterpoints and still keep the whole, you know, the whole song alive. It's just, it's yeah. Very, very talented people there that are just wow. doing incredible things. Right? And it's, yeah. And it's the kind of thing where when you listen to it, you don't, you don't sit here at your desk, you're transported elsewhere. It's just that kind of yeah. journey. When you hear music like that, it's usually, it's not in the background. It's nope. not something you can listen to while you're, <laughs> while, while you're, while you're working. working on a spreadsheet. No, no, no. <laughs> it's an experience, which is so cool. That's intense. I and love it's great it. for running though. It's absolutely oh, yeah. great for running. Gives you a lot of extra oomph, you know? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, like, I like to do uh, uh, a few kilometers a week, uh, you know, uh, 20 or 25 kilometers a week of running. And, and uh, that's always my favorite is run my, with my AirPods and yeah. uh, some heavy metal to, to give me that extra push, right? Yeah, you can't just, um, yeah, you can't just listen to that. Um, so on the total opposite of the scale, because yes, there's that and those that kind of music where it just ignites you. You're, it's powerful. It builds you up and you feel like unstoppable. That's great. Well, I'm married a Texan and I'd like to think I was married into becoming a Texan because I my heart is so much in Texas. And we mm -hmm. went to go see the classic Brooks and Dunn, which my kids love. It was their very first concert ever. It's a classic um, country duo. Mm -hmm. And it was so hard to stay in the seats. Like here's this music and it just, you want to swing and you want to dance to it. You want to get up and we just had to sit still in the seats. I'm like, this is a great concert. And I'm so proud of them that they're still playing and they sound great. They really do, but it is wrong 
to be sitting and this <laughs> it just didn't feel right I yeah, yeah. Right and, kind of and that's what's so nice about these open open air festivals right because you can jump and up and down <laughs> to your heart's content right yeah i will not do mosh pits anymore though that's one thing i don't do anymore mosh pits because uh I've broken a shoulder in one of those one Ooh. of those years ago Ooh. yeah yeah can't do but, that i no. mean it's fun to do it it's fun to get in there and just uh, play it? play with everyone and get crazy yeah. and just you know enjoy the the moment right but yeah that's maybe my husband going a bit tells me that but i'm always like really we saw woodstock 99 the documentary together have you seen that at all not yet people Ooh. told me i need to watch that you need to yeah. watch it it's as you know, it's totally out of control. Like it's just a case study in what could go wrong at a concert. Yeah. But my husband reminded me, and this is so counterintuitive and I know we're getting off track, but it's casual space. So it's all good Sure. that when you're in the mosh pit, everyone watches out for each other. If someone falls down, you get picked up right away. And everyone's right. like, you good? You okay? All right, keep going. Where um, it's, that just seemed counterintuitive. It's like, wait a minute, aren't you out there to and hurt each other and my husband's like no no you're out there to aggressively express the song and then if things happen everyone stops everyone re re you know collect connects and then go again is that yep. that's really it huh yeah, yeah it really is and and it's all about the you know enjoying the moment enjoying the music and enjoying the camaraderie that you have right Oof. you become friends with people so quickly of course the beer helps too right but <laughs> The but, <laughs> music helps too. Yeah, the God. music and the beer, right? It's if just I heard the, that, the, I would be, I'd be like, give me a weapon. I'm going to go into the village and just tear it up. I would just be like, <laughs> and I don't even know what I'm talking about. I'm just saying it's so, it just feels like you can conquer anyone, anything. It really does. It's intense. I know. But for me, um, I'm not a runner. I'm a swimmer. And when I, I do listen to music oh. while I swim. Yeah. Which is I, great. Do you have a uh, waterproof? I do. Uh, I do. How does that work? I know. So I got these like five years ago and oh. they're probably needing to be refreshed, but I have just been using them and charging them and recharging them. So you put, it's just a tiny little AirPod, like a little, oh. um, they used to be called like an Apple AirPod or like a, just a little music library of maybe okay. 20, 30 songs. And um, you plug it right up under my swim cap and then I plug in the waterproof. Oh. Yes. And then when I'm in the water, I, I swim a lot without them too, because I really want the rhythm and the breathing, but I put that song on and I will be in that water for hours. And I'm like, Oh, I gotta, I gotta get out. I gotta go <laughs> because you just get into that rhythm and you, you have no other choice, but to breathe and move and breathe and move. And I don't get phone calls. My brain can't think about things and I can't do anything else, but breathe and move where, but it's different than dance. I can't express myself. I have to stay yeah. rhythmatic, which I think I would really love. And if I do have to keep floating too, which means you have to keep moving or else you, yeah. you start sinking. Right. Yeah. Some but, people but, sink. I float. I'm right? pretty good. I don't know. I don't know. My husband sings. <laughs> You're very buoyant. I very good so. for you. Would that make me a good astronaut candidate? I think, I think it would. I think so. <laughs> I think so. You're probably in the top tier there, you know, of, of potential uh, potential candidates, right? There's that tier reference again. See, yeah. let's uh -huh. get them to um, put their music on this part of the show. It would be awesome. Oh, wonder yeah. If, <laughs> I wonder if oh, they yeah. <laughs> Well, this has been great, Robert. I seriously do not know when or how you sleep, but I'm in it with you. I'm always looking for the fantastic people to share the stories and the adventures like you're doing. So thank you for sharing them with us. What else is new? Anything else going on? I mean, I, I, I don't know how or when. <laughs> is there anything else you're up to that's going to be launched or new or around the corner? Yeah, well, I guess I guess one little tidbit. Uh, I, I got um, approached and conscripted by uh, a movie producer a few months ago that uh, wanted me to to read a script as a space movie, and. I reluctantly said, yeah, okay, fine, fine. Read the script, loved it, loved the script. Uh, made a few comments about the script itself because it okay. wasn't, uh, it, there were some things that I thought, nah, this would not happen. It wouldn't Wait, be right. story-wise or technically? Story-wise, story-wise. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, story and technically on something that would not be possible there. Okay. Um, okay. So I made those comments and they were really taken by that. And so the producers of the movie really want the movie to be uh, realistic sure. and not... 
you know, still within the Hollywood genre of, you know, doing things for the last, you know, save the world kind of uh, theme, okay. uh, but very realistic and very real on what um, safe is. So it turns out that uh, because I've been able to bring a, a company or two, make some introductions for a company or two to participate in the movie with their technology, that I'm going to be an executive producer in that movie. And I haven't done much, but that uh, is you know, so cool. they're trying to benefit from the fact that I know a lot of people in the industry. So I'm going to be, a, I'm going to be an executive producer in the movie. And we'll tell you when it gets announced. Yes, please. That's but uh, incredible. It, it should be kind of fun. Should be Are fun. they going to film it on your zero G platform? Uh, no, it will be <laughs> filmed. It will be so, filmed sooner than that. So, Whoa. Oh, that's yeah. incredible. So you know early, this early story? Next year. You already know yeah. the story and how it's, oh my gosh. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's so, well, it's like a secret that only you have. Well, there'll be uh, some announcements made soon before okay. before the IAC or Euro Consults in, in September. So, yeah. There That's we go. really great. Well, of course. There's a little fun side thing that has come my way. So, I, you yeah, know, I thought I you were going to no. say they asked me to be the lead role because no, no, you certainly no. could. <laughs> you could. <laughs> I told I told Chad the other day about um, us and having this conversation, and he was like, "Oh, sure, I know him." And you always, whenever <laughs> I talk about you, I'm like, "He's busy. He's doing all this stuff, and you probably recognize him." I show him your photo. He's like, "Yep." So you could totally be the leading role. I think. Oh, thank you, Beth. But Absolutely. no, that's not my thing. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet Ex executive not yet. director moving on yeah, well that is so enough. cool um well we've got to have you back on the show to update us on all the latest and next things but seriously i love your enthusiasm and your optimism and i love that you're in it like it's so rare that people in the trenches people who are doing these things and working on these things to move them forward it's like anything else. It's your industry and you love it, but there's exhaustion, there's burnout, there's things that frustrate us all. And you continue to carry that optimism through it all the time, every time I see you and call you. So <laughs> thank you. And thank you for sharing that with us because it is fun. Thank you, Beth. I really appreciate it. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be an eternal optimist that is not realist, realistic sure. about things. Um, but but I do have it in, in me, and, and and I'm very thankful for that. So thank, thanks for for saying it because that's what drives me, right? Is the uh, the satisfaction of doing something you love. And uh, I'm very lucky. I'm very very lucky to be in yeah. the space industry. Right. Yes, I'm lucky to know you. Well, come on back, and we'll do this again and get that update. You got a deal, Beth. Thank you so much. You got it.